And we're dealing with material um, in week 10, laws 11059, statutory interpretation. And we're now dealing with statutory presumptions, which follows on from the common law presumptions that judges had traditionally made in the interpretation of legislation. So let's start a little differently this time by having a quiz in relation to some of the basic elements that we dealt with last week being common law presumptions. So which of the following four statements is the most accurate? A, the standard law of precedent applies to statutory interpretation. B, applying statutory interpretation rules is similar to applying the doctrine of precedent. C, the interpretation of a provision by a superior court is binding on the courts below it if the facts are substantially similar. And D, precedent has no role to play in statutory interpretation. Which of those do you think is correct? Arguably a few of them are, but in my view C is the one that represents the best answer. The interpretation of a provision by a superior court is binding on courts below it if the facts are sufficiently similar. Just on that issue of um, precedent, there is a mistake that people sometimes make of assuming that a precedent is something that must be relied upon by all future courts, irrespective of um, the, the nature of the courts hearing the original matter or the subsequent matter or the type of matter that's being dealt with. So when it comes to precedent, think in terms of that which is of a superior court as generally binding on courts below it. However, an easy matter uh, for argument uh, against um, a case that appears to be against you is that the lawyers distinguish the current case from the facts of the previous case and therefore based on that distinction argue that the provision by the superior court is not binding because the facts are not sufficiently similar. I hope that makes sense. All right. I mentioned last week that there are three basic common law rules, the literal rule, the golden rule, and the mischief rule. So the next question relates to those. Under which traditional common law approach would resort to extrinsic material be least likely? The literal rule, A, B, the golden rule, C, the mischief rule, or D, extrinsic materials were not used under any of those approaches. Which one do you think it is? I think the answer is pretty clearly A, the literal rule. The next question is this. We talked early, earlier last week about appeal process and the way in which appeal courts can consider matters. So. Can parties appeal on the basis of error in a court's statutory interpretation? You might recall that we said that statutory interpretation is a question of law rather than question of fact. So can a party appeal on the basis of a court incorrectly interpreting a statute? A, yes. B, no. C, only if it was a single judge, not a full court and D, only if, without the error, there would have been a different outcome in the case. This question is a good one because it's easy to think, well, you people have got appeal rights. But I've mentioned earlier this evening um, that there are issues around whether a precedent is binding on another court. Um, so appeal appeals as a matter of right in all circumstances. Anyway, can, an, can parties appeal on the basis of errors in a court statutory interpretation? The basic and simple answer is yes, they can. Now, the next question is to do with common law and statutory interpretation. I mentioned that it is important to consider the Acts Interpretation Act, 
and be guarded in your approach to common law principles. But can prior common law be used in statutory interpretation? A, always, common law is superior to statutes. B, if the statute provides for this to occur. C, unless the statute completely override the common law. And D, if the statute is ambiguous or leads to a result that is manifestly absurd or unreasonable. Well, the answer is C. Unless the statute completely overrides the common law, there is always a place for considering the common law in statutory interpretation arguments. The next question is, which of the common law rules is most likely to be applied where a court decides to interpret, in the event a vessel sinks, all passengers are entitled to compensation to exclude stowaways and pirates. So the statutory provision says, if a vessel sinks, all passengers are entitled to compensation. Which of the common law rules would not most likely be applied if it was sought to exclude stowaways and pirates from that general principle of being able to be compensated? A, the literal rule, B, the golden rule, C, the mischief rule, or D, all of those? Which one do you think it is? I think it's the mischief rule. But the golden rule arguably could also apply. All right, so this week we're dealing strictly with statutory presumptions. And when we talk about statutory presumptions, we're really contrasting that with common law presumptions. So um, with statutory presumptions, it's fair to say that when a statute is created, the drafters of the statute will consider the common law. So in a sense, the topic of statutory presumptions is something of a misnomer because we're really concerned with the common law presumptions that apply that ultimately become statutory presumptions. And I hope that makes sense. So like all common law rules, parliament can override through legislation, which means that any common law presumptions are always rebuttable, both by parliaments and the courts. But nevertheless, they are based on powerful legal concepts. And some of those are the rule of law, the sanctity of private property, the concept of freedom of the individual. So therefore, common law principles are not surrendered lightly when interpreting a statute. So a statutory presumption in many ways is to consider the preservation of common law principles unless there's very clearly overridden by the statute. And I do hope that makes sense. So I guess the question is, how and when do you apply statutory presumptions? Now, this is an extension on what we discussed last week, because we're really talking about the rules of statutory interpretation, which developed at common law and have some ongoing and continuing application. And the presumptions are subsidiary to the modern approach for this reason, that as we know, our requirement is to look to the text. We do that first. We identify the meaning of the text as a legislative provision, but we do so within the context and in light of its purpose. So the question then is, if there is a common law or statutory presumption, does that colour in any way? Does it influence? Does it modify? And if so, to what extent? The text or the context, or the purpose. Bearing in mind that when we talk about the context or purpose of statutory interpretation, it may have some reference to common law principles in any event. So if it's evident from the text or the context or the purpose that an alternative means a meaning should be used, then the statutory presumption 
may not even be applied in those circumstances. Right, so here's a, a little thing for you to ponder. Once we get our head around what we mean by a statutory presumption, then I'll suggest to you that the statutory presumption would apply generally, but it would not apply if it's rebutted. Rebuttal meaning that it's said to have no effect. So a statutory presumption, can it be rebutted by A, clear words, or B, a clear implication, such as where otherwise the provision would be meaningless? To answer that question, I'll refer you to a High Court decision. It's Coco against the Crown, 1994 179 CLR 427. And if you haven't picked up on it, um, lawyers tend to refer to the Crown in replace of R, which is Rex or Regina. So Coco v R, also known as Coco and the Crown. So that's an example where the implication was sufficient, um, where the judgment of the majority of the court said, the presumption is rebuttable and will be displaced if there's a clear implication that authority to enter and remain upon private property was intended. So in that case, the court was considering the manner of statutory interpretation about whether a certain provision should apply where there's a requirement to enter or remain upon private property. So clear implication can be sufficient, although clear words of rebuttal will also clearly apply. So the answer to the question is A and B. If an expression which has a long-standing meaning at common law is included in Commonwealth legislation, then the question is, to what extent will that long-standing meaning at common law be applied in interpreting the legislation? Now, you've probably got a couple of things going through your mind here. The first is that we've been saying that the text should be considered from the outset. We've also considered that the ordinary meaning of the word should be considered. But what if the ordinary meaning is in some way affected by the long-standing meaning of the same word at common law, which may by implication be different to the ordinary meaning. What do we do then? I'll give you four potential answers and I'll invite you to provide a response. A, the court will always apply the established definition of the word. B, the courts will presume the common law meaning applies unless the context suggests otherwise. C, the courts will never use a common law definition, only a statutory or, different, or dictionary definition. And D, the courts would not apply any presumption in this situation. So when we're talking about statutory and presumptions, the question is, to what extent will we use a statutory presumption if it's a long-standing meaning at common law? How do we avoid this issue of going with the ordinary meaning or the long-standing legal meaning at common law? Well, bear in mind what we discussed last week when I referred you to the Queensland Law Handbook. Because in that handbook, you'll, see, you'll recall there's a commentary about how legal drafters go about drafting legislation. And drafters of legislation will consider the common law meaning of words when drafting the legislation. So therefore, courts, in interpreting that legislation, will assume that the drafters had in mind the long-standing meaning at common law when selecting those words into the statute. And accordingly, the rule of statutory interpretation in that regard is that the courts will presume 
of the common law meaning applies unless the context suggests otherwise. So that would be an exception to the general rule of, as it were, immediately applying the ordinary meaning. Now the common law meaning and the ordinary meaning may coincide, but they need not do. So an example I used earlier uh, was provocation, which has a particular common law meaning. It's actually now built into the statute in the criminal code, but that's slightly different to the ordinary meaning. Now, the next question is this, which of the following is incorrect? A, there, there is a presumption that parliament does not intend to interfere with vested property rights. B, native title is presumed not to have been extinguished by legislation, except by clear and plain intent. C, it is presumed that all crimes must have some form of mens rea. Or D, they are all correct. And the answer is they're all correct. So there are some examples that I've given you in that question of statutory presumptions. Now, I guess what you're getting to the stage of having to do is think about well, how do I know where the statutory presumptions are? How do I build them into my flowchart? When do I think about these things logically in the context of answering a statutory interpretation problem? There's no necessarily right single answer, correct answer on that. And you'll need to try to build that into your own flowchart and your own mini precedents for use in answering a legal problem. I'm sorry to be vague, but that's just the way it is on that issue. The next question is this. Does legislation have extraterritorial effect? The general rule, of course, in Queensland, I've probably given away the answer there, but say in Queensland, Queensland law applies in Queensland. Commonwealth law applies in the Commonwealth. Can laws apply in some way beyond the territory of the lawmakers? A, yes, B, no, C, not usually, and D, Commonwealth legislation can, state and territory legislation cannot. So is it possible for laws to have extraterritorial effect? And the answer is C, not usually, but it, it, but it is possible. So there's laws made by the Commonwealth which make it illegal for certain Australian citizens to conduct themselves in certain ways overseas, for example. Now, the statutory presumption is included in the Commonwealth Acts Interpretation Act. Have a look at section 21.1b. Those of you that have really carefully read that and the Queensland counterpart were probably onto that already. So legislation can have extraterritorial effect if it's rebutted by clear words. Um, so that is the presumption of it not having extraterritorial effect is rebutted by clear words. The next question is this, can legislation take away power of the courts to hear a matter? That's an interesting one. So now we're dealing with the issue of the power of legislation to limit or exclude the role of the courts. It's a touchy area, isn't it? Because parliament and the executive and the courts independent, like separately represent the three pillars. There's a clear connection between parliament and the executive, but usually there's a very strict divide between the courts and parliament slash the executive. Can, can legislation stop the courts hearing a matter? A, yes, fully. B, yes, but there's a right of appeal back to a court. C, yes, but the Commonwealth legislation can do this. And D, no. The answer is actually B. It is possible for legislation to take away power of the courts to hear certain matters. Um, we tend to see this in the lower jurisdictions a little bit where 
courts will say that um, a power statute may say, for example, that courts do not have power to deal with certain disputes unless the matter's gone to legislation. So to that extent, the power has been taken away from the court. But you can always challenge that legislation by going to a court, um, which is a little um, odd in the thinking, I guess, but that's just the way it is. Now, in administrative law, we deal with judicial reviews and we deal with merits reviews. So the reason these things are relevant to that question is this. A merits review is where a substantive uh, decision is made by a substitute decision maker as an independent body. And in a merits review, the court or the tribunal, as the case may be, considers the decision and makes the correct and preferable decision. So um, an example is this. Um, someone applies for a blue card. They're knocked back by the executive. The right of appeal is by way of merits review in Queensland to the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal. So when the tribunal deals with that case, it's not an appeal as such, it's a review. And the merits review means that the court, the, sorry, the tribunal, as it were, sits in the shoes of the original decision maker and makes the correct and preferable decision, is the wording in the Act. So, in other words, it hears the, the, the tribunal hears the matter afresh and determines whether the blue card should be given or not. And in doing so, the tribunal doesn't look at the way in which the original decision maker went about making the decision, um, didn't, doesn't scrutinise that decision, doesn't concern itself with whether there was some bias or um, failure to provide natural justice. It just simply replaces the decision maker and it's the tribunal decision sits, overrides, completely overrides the original decision. And that's why we say it's the correct and preferable decision. Now, contrast a merits review to a judicial review. Now, this is different, and it's where the original decision-making process is scrutinised, and it may be attacked for a number of reasons, such as bias or failure to provide procedural fairness. So judicial review is a different character of um, administrative law to merits reviews. All right, let's go back to another quiz question. In which of the following would it not be presumed that legislation binds the Crown? A, or common law legislation, B, criminal legislation, C, legislation in South Australia, or D, none. The presumption always applies unless it's rebutted. The answer is C. So the presumption is embedded in Section 13 of the Queensland Acts Interpretation Act, but in South Australia, that presumption is reversed. All right, um, so when you're considering these issues, um, it is important to bear in mind the distinction between both the Commonwealth and the Queensland Acts Interpretation Act, and also bear in mind the distinction between Acts Interpretation Acts within the states of Australia, which are all substantially similar, but certainly as we've just seen in that instance, not identical by any means. The next is, if a statute provided that unauthorised use of a shoulder of a highway is prohibited and the penalty was two years imprisonment, which of the following four examples applies or four possible answers? A, a court would not apply a presumption regarding the situation. B, a court would liberally apply a provision because it is dangerous to stop in the shoulder of a highway. C, a court would strictly construe the provision so it did not apply, for example, to the driver of a car that had broken down. Or D, a court would presume it does not apply to cyclists, even if the statute did not say anything about cyclists. There's a few potential answers there to consider. And that question really goes to the heart of the statutory presumptions where we need to consider how the court will construe certain provisions. Now, clearly the literal rule doesn't apply and the courts do adopt a common sense approach. 
keep that in mind if you're arguing a case or you're arguing for a certain um, interpretation based on statutory interpretation principles. I think of those options, the best answer is C, a court would strictly construe the provision so that it did not apply, um, for example, uh, to a driver of a car that had broken down. Um, well, I think probably not strictly construe the provision is what I meant to say. Now, where legislation provides for women who give birth to have three months paid maternity leave, and it's unclear whether that applies to a child that's stillborn, which of the following four answers would be correct? Again, these are all examples of how you might consider the use of statutory presumptions and common law presumptions in a, in a realistic situation. So A, the court will presume the legislation applies to live births only. B, the court will apply to all births, lives or, or live or stillbirth, um, stillborn because the legislation refers more to labor than motherhood. C, the court will favor a broad construction in favor of the mother if that was appropriate considering the context and the purpose. And D, the court will refer the matter to parliamentary kit uh, for clarification. Um, well, I think C, the court will favour a broad construction in favour of the mother, if that was the appropriate course of action, considering the context and the purpose. All right, um, that might do us for this session. Please continue to read the text carefully. And part of the purpose of this session was to have you think more broadly about the statutory provisions and when you might apply them in a realistic situation in answering a statutory interpretation problem. See you next time. Thank you.